Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third annual Ed Roberts Champions of Accessibility Celebration. My name is Mari Chimitris, and I'm the graduate assistant for the Access Office, and I'll be your host this evening. On behalf of Access, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for the celebration, and we're so glad that you decided to spend a portion of your evening with us. As we get started with the celebration this evening, uh, we ask you to please remain muted unless otherwise directed. Uh, typically, we would applaud for all of our speakers and award winners. However, instead, if you're able, we would like to invite you to take advantage of all that Zoom has to offer by utilizing the chat box. If you don't have it open, please go ahead and select the chat at the bottom of your screen to open it up and go ahead and say hi um, or good evening or however you're feeling tonight. This will be a great way for us to show gratitude to our speakers and we'll also highlight and share some information along the way. Uh, you also may want to utilize the Zoom reactions. Um, they are also at the bottom of your screen. So you can select some of those pre-provided emojis or click those three dots and pick something random. I know it's almost Halloween, so you can pick a ghost. Uh, so just pick whatever you might be feeling tonight. Uh, so for those of you who may not know, ACCESS stands for Accessible Campus Community and Equitable Student Support. ACCESS believes all students should come to SIUE with the expectation not just to attend, but to graduate. In order to accomplish that mission, ACCESS works to ensure diverse learners have equitable access to all curricular and co-curricular opportunities offered by the institution. Through interactive discussion with students, ACCESS works to remove campus barriers to coordinate reasonable accommodations for eligible students in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. However, Offices like Access did not always exist on college campuses, and many people had to speak up and advocate for disability rights in order for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 to be enforced and for the Americans with Disabilities Act to be created and passed, which only happened 31 years ago in 1990. So tonight we're here uh, to honor the legacy of disability rights leader Ed Roberts. He is regarded by many as the father of the independent living movement and a pioneering leader for disability rights. In the spirit of Ed Roberts and his activism and advocacy, we will also take time this evening to honor faculty, staff, and student who have been champions of accessibility here at SIUE. We're gonna hear from students about their experiences of accessibility on campus, about how accommodations are assisting them in their fields of study, and how each of us can take steps Mara, you're muted. Yep, Mara, you're muted. Have I been unmuted? Okay, I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, we're going to share about the life of Ed Roberts. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about him. Uh, so Edward Roberts was born on January 23rd in 1939 in San Mateo, California, to parents Zona and Vern Roberts. He was the oldest of four boys. Ed was primarily raised in Burlingame, California. Growing up, Ed loved baseball and became a star athlete and captain of his local team. At age 14, Ed contracted a severe case of polio, which caused him to become paralyzed from the neck down except for movement in two fingers and several toes. His condition affected the muscles around his lungs and required the use of an iron lung or respirator to breathe. When not in the lung, he survived by frog breathing, a technique by forcing air into the lungs using the face and neck muscles. Because of his condition, Ed could not easily attend high school in person and mostly attended via phone. He was also unable to complete his physical education and driver's education courses. These courses were required by his high school for graduation, and initially his high school was not going to allow him to graduate. Thankfully, his mother, Zona, petitioned the school board for Ed's diploma, and the decision was reversed, and Ed was able to graduate. Ed would later credit his mother for helping teach him, by example, to advocate for himself and fight for what he needed. And, and Ed's high school yearbook staff dedicated the 1957 edition of the Panther Tracks to him for his determination and involvement at school. After attending a local college for two years, 
Ed was the first student with severe disabilities to attend the University of Berkeley, California, Berkeley. But this was only after challenging the administration for admission. Initially unaware of his disability when he applied, Berkeley refused to admit him on the basis that his 800 pound lung would not fit in a dormitory. However, once they did admit Ed, a director of campus health offered him a room in an empty wing of the Crowell Hospital on campus. Ed agreed to this arrangement only if everyone would treat his living arrangement as a dormitory. His admission made it possible for other students with severe disabilities to attend UC Berkeley and Crowell Hospital uh, wing and it turned into the Crowell Residence Program. The students who lived there developed a sense of group identity and began to call themselves the Rolling Quads. While on campus, Ed and his peers advocated for curb cuts and developed the Physically Disabled Students Program. This program was run by and for students with disabilities to provide wheelchair repair, attendant referral, peer counseling, and other services designed to allow them to live in the community. He was quoted as saying, we will not tolerate another generation of young people with disabilities going through segregated education and segregated society, being dependent on their parents and public aid. We can make a difference in their future. If people with disabilities have a future, then everyone in our society will have a future. During his four years at UC Berkeley, Ed earned both his bachelor's and master's in political science. In 1972, members of the Physically Disabled Students Program founded the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, California. This would not only be the first independent living center in the world, um, but an institution which employs persons with disabilities to run the services helping other people with disabilities. Ed was quoted as saying, we're going to develop leadership that has a fundamental difference. That is, it's inclusive. It believes in people and in our strengths together, and we are going to change our society. Their first success was a campaign persuading the city of Berkeley to install curb cuts, which permitted wheelchair access. And over the span of three years under Ed's leadership, the sitter's budget increased from 40000 to $3 million. In 1976, Ed became the director of the California Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. Ironically, this was the same agency that deemed him too disabled to hold a job 14 years prior in 1962. As director, he went on to establish independent living centers throughout the state of California. In 1983, Ed became president and co-founder of the World Institute on Disability. The work of WID was similar to independent living, but on a bigger scale. The mission of WID is to promote and create public policies that encourages the accessibility of disabled individuals. A year later, Ed Roberts was awarded the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. He used the funding to aid the World Institute on Disability. During his life, Ed Roberts traveled around the world to lobby for disability rights until his death in 1995. Ed Roberts said, live the life you've always dreamed of. Be fearless in the face of adversity. Never stop learning. Use your imagination whenever possible. Recognize the beauty that surrounds you. Remember where you came from, but never lose sight of where you're going. So tonight in the spirit of independence, equality and freedom, we honor the life and legacy of Ed Roberts and those who continue to advocate for equity and inclusion for everyone. Ed Roberts doesn't seem like he's, he's often talked about or celebrated, but he's definitely an incredible role model for what it looks like to advocate and create change when it comes to disability rights and accessibility. I'd now like to introduce Ryan Pugh, Ryan is a junior here at SIUE, and she will be using her voice by singing No More Fear from Freaky Friday the Musical. She will also be sharing with us how the themes of the song have helped her to become an advocate for herself and gain self-confidence during her time at SIUE. So let's hear from Ryan. Thank you, and today I will be performing No More Fear from Freaky Friday. What is this feeling that I'm feeling? Like I've shot right through the ceiling? Is it only the caffeine and the sugar? And the pizza? Oh dear, I've had three slices of that pizza. Are carbs the feeling that I'm feeling? Like I'm losing you for dealing. It's alarming, but appealing, and somehow healing. Chaos be. 
Hello everyone, can you hear me? Perfect. Hi, my name is Ryan Pugh and I am a junior here with, at SIUE with a double major in special education and music theater. I know it's a strange combination. There are two majors in extremely demanding and difficult programs which hardly any of the classes overlap. Coming to SIUE for me was a key step into being brave and leaving the fear of failure behind me. It was turning the key to open the door to an uncharted journey where I have learned to accept more of who I am and to understand what I am truly capable of. Here at SIUE, with the help of Access, I have been able to become less fearful about my struggles with self-confidence and other stigmas that are attributed to being diagnosed with learning differences and auditory processing disorder, type one diabetes, and partial color blindness. The journey to where I'm at was not an easy one. I had to learn how to advocate for myself. Growing up with learning difficulties meant being pulled out of classes to focus on my areas of need. I missed a lot of time with my peers, more than I wanted to, that's for sure. I was afraid that I would never be seen as normal. I was worried that I was disappointing my family. I was concerned that I would not be able to reach my dreams. Not to mention I was terrified every time the annual meeting, the one with all my teachers, the one most students with disabilities dread. Yeah, that meeting. I can't even imagine how my parents felt. They for sure went to more meetings than I did. I understand what it's like to be told by teachers that I may never learn past a sixth grade level, that I will not be able to succeed in college and that my fields of study are too physically demanding for me to be able to handle. I had my doubts about being able to hand, handle one major, let alone two. Well, here I am. SIUE's access has helped me to have no more fear in many key ways. Access has provided me tools that have allowed me to have less anxiety with my struggles and in turn allowed me to make strides towards my dreams. It is my dream to teach. I want to be able to inspire students to become successful. I want to advocate for my students so that they too can take steps into following their dreams. I am here because I developed the self-confidence to advocate for myself with the help of the support systems that cared about me and fought for me and told me day after day that I was strong and that I was more than capable of reaching and surpassing my dreams. I want to do the same for my students. Growing up, music theater gave me an outlet from the stressful and frustrating environments of school. From the age of 10, I was able to participate in an organization called the Penguin Project. This organization gives students with disabilities a chance to be the cast of a full theater, music theater production. Through the Penguin Project, I was able to find my career path. My dream is to start a performing arts studio for students and young adults focusing on inclusion of students with all abilities. Now, the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes my senior year of high school brought many new challenges. I had finally learned how to advocate for myself and gain some self-confidence to pursue college even with my learning difficulties. But now I had this health curveball thrown at me. Let's just say my transition from high school to college was filled with fear. However, I remember the day that I toured SIUE's campus. I remembered one of our scheduled stops on our little checklist for the day was to make sure that we met with access. 
I went in and with my parents and when I got to the access area, the lady at the front desk handed me a little gray phone key. Little did I know that that was my key to success. When I met with the staff at Access during that meeting, they were so thorough. They took the time to understand my background and to put in place accommodations that were right for me. That meeting washed away some of the anxieties that I had about transitioning from college. Fast forward to my first day of classes, I was scared to death. I was so nervous that my blood sugar spiked. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to process what my teachers were saying. But because I had access on my side, I had less to worry about. I knew that I had a team that was there for me, that wanted to help me succeed. My double major in my college journey would have been much, much more difficult without this, my support system that I had and the welcoming and amazing faculty at SIUE and especially at Access. Now fast forward to my sophomore year. I was going strong, I was making good grades, I was, I was learning more than I ever thought I could. College, it was going great. Well, until my anxiety returned when one of my professors denied my accommodations. This teacher told me that they didn't think I needed it. And they told me that time and a half was given to everyone. So I didn't need to go up to Access to take my test. Well, of course, when I informed Access about the scenarios, one of the staff members, they fought for me. They helped me email my teacher and explain why, in fact, I do need to go to Access for my testing accommodations. I was able to explain to my professor that accommodations make it so that I have an even playing field with other students. I go up to access to read the test out loud to myself so that I can process what the test question is asking. I need to leave the room to test so that I don't disturb the other students with the alarms that may go off due to my diabetes. And I may need to take breaks when I take a test because I get anxious, despite the fact that I know the material. And that makes my blood sugar rise to dangerous levels. I explained to my professor that though it may seem that I don't need accommodations because I do have good grades, my accommodations are there for a reason. I realized that I didn't need to fear, that I was strong, and that I, with guidance, learned how to fight for myself. Access helped me bring these awarenesses to disability and how everyone learns differently. This song, No More Fear, represents my journey with disability. It's hard to learn how to advocate for oneself. It's hard to learn to try something new. It's hard to take a leap of faith. It's hard to make the choice to stay positive when it feels like the world is against you. It's hard to focus on my strengths and not my weaknesses. It's hard to live in a world where disability awareness is not yet at the level where I believe it should be. In this song, the character is learning to let go of the fear that she has worked so hard at ensuring everything was so perfect that she realized her fear was affecting her potential. This was me. Disability is scary. It is a world of unknown, but in the world of the unknown, this song reminds me to be bold. I may not be able to promise that everything will be okay, but the most important thing is to get rid of the fear, to be bold and to stop dwelling on the danger and dare to live instead. This song motivates me to let go of my past and of my self-consciousness and my anxiousness. It tells me to be okay that it is okay to be weak, and that it is okay to be unsure, but to fight and to let my support systems be there to fight with me. I can accomplish my dreams by advocating for myself and accepting help from others. I can move forward in my career to use the things that I have learned from not only the song, but my journey growing up and with access to use my experiences to teach students, my students, to advocate for themselves and to be the support systems that they need to make their dreams come true. My key to success was a strong support system and letting go of the fear that filled my head because I was labeled as different. In an unknown world, take your key to success and turn it into a key to unlock your potential and surpass your dreams. Continue to bring awareness to disability by being bold to talk about it and teach others that being different can be a great addition to our world. Everyone learns differently. As leaders, it is our job to accept others by using respectful language to speak out and embrace individuals for who they are and not for what their diagnosis may be. Disability Awareness Month may be coming to an end, but with help in the community, with your help in the community, by advocating for individuals with disabilities, more people will have access to opportunities like mine. 
I hope that when you leave here today, you will have courage to spread awareness to others, to teachers, to parents, to students. I hope that you will make the choice to stay positive and to be strength-based. There will never be enough time to thank every person that has helped me along my journey, but when I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to reach my dreams, the team here at Access put the key in the door and helped me take steps so that I could jump into a world of possibilities. I encourage you to be a key in somebody's life. Most of us are here because of a key that unlocked our potential. Now it's our turn to be a key for others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan, for singing and for sharing your story with us. It was wonderful to hear just about your time on campus and how you're continuing to learn to advocate for yourself and growing in confidence of who you are. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear from two more students about their experiences on campus and the current state of accessibility at SIUE. Access feels it's important to listen and learn from student experiences, and we hope you'll listen closely to what each of these students have to share. Our first state of accessibility address is going to be come from Elena. Elena is a psychology student at SIUE and has been a student worker in the Access office for the past three years. I've had the opportunity to get to know Elena this semester and I've been amazed how patient and kind she is to every student that walks in to Access and for every parent that calls and faculty member that has a question, she's just always willing to give a helping hand. So please will you give a warm welcome of reactions and chat comments to Elena. All right, hi everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> um, so as Lamar said, I've been working at Access for three years now. Um, and so when I started as a freshman, I knew basically next to nothing about um, accommodations just because it wasn't really something that um, I had a lot of experience with. So I really think it's important to mention that because everybody starts somewhere and it's not necessarily about um, where you start from. It's more important that you learn and you just work hard to make sure that you are providing an accessible um, just atmosphere, making this campus more accessible. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that because I am going to talk about how like some of the students' experiences that I have seen um, coming through our office. And then I'm also gonna talk about like my interactions with professors and stuff like that, because I also do that um, with my perspective of working at Access. Um, so some of the like student challenges that I've seen is we've had students come into our office and they've been in tears, close to tears, frustrated, just struggling. And a lot of it, sometimes has to do with professors. And so, for instance, we've had students come in and professors have denied their accommodations or just professors said, I don't understand why you need that accommodation or things like that, um, which, you know, isn't how it should be for sure. And then there's also been times when students have tried to take things into their own hands and communicate with professors and there hasn't been very much interaction on the professor's end of things. Um, so that student is being brave and advocating for themselves, and they're not really receiving um, anything for that. So that's definitely something that needs to change um, on our campus. And I also think it's important to mention that there are people that go above and beyond and do a great job of making this place more accessible. And that's very important. And thank you guys for doing that. Um, so yeah, I also, another example of a time when accessibility wasn't really provided to students is there is a student that had captioning as an accommodation and they needed captions in class and they got to class and there were not captions. And the professor said, oh, you know, we'll just talk about it after class. So the student wasn't able to attend class. And that's just another example of accessibility kind of being ignored and just like pushed away of like, oh, it's something that we'll figure out later. Um, yeah, so those are really like the main stories that I have that really stick out to me. And I just wanna reiterate that it's very important that everybody takes it upon themselves and 
makes it their individual responsibility to make sure that SIUE is accessible because it's not just the job of access or the people that work here, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, and then I guess another few examples that I do have is obviously our students come to college to take classes and to take those classes, do well, and then graduate. And if people are not providing them with tools to do that, then, you know, what do you expect? Um, it definitely shouldn't be that way. So a part of classes is getting to classes. And I know that there, I think it was this semester when like Dunham's Hall, Dunham Hall's elevator went out and it wasn't fixed. And people weren't able to get where they need to go because not everybody has the ability to use the stairs. And it's just another example of how accessibility was kind of ignored and put on the back burner, um, which I say all these things and they might seem kind of negative, but I do think it's very important to talk about these things because if we don't talk about them, then we can't fix them or improve anything. Um, so yeah, I would just encourage people to have, you know, difficult conversations or speak up if they see something. And I also just want to thank everyone that is doing that and just to encourage you to continue to do that. So that's all that I have to say. Um, for our next state of accessibility address, we're going to hear from Katie Hall. And this is her first semester on campus. And these past 10 weeks, she has overcome a lot of barriers and she's really just advocated for herself. So I can't wait to hear what she says. I'm going to turn it over to you, Katie. Okay, can you hear me? Uh -oh. Yes, yeah. we can hear you, Katie. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. <laughs> okay, so you know how Elena was talking about um, everybody just being accessible. This is the first campus um, that I've been to that has had that mentality. Um, I'm 21 years old and have experienced very little accessibility in my life. Um, my professors have absolutely blown me away um, by how accessible they've been. I've had some that will send me multiple copies of something until it's accessible. And several of them check with me like, hey, are you understanding the material? Um, I've had experiences like wanting to go to an event, not being sure if I should because I don't want to be a burden on anybody. And then somebody invites me and personally just stays with me like the whole time and helps me to have a good time with, it, with the event. And just here on campus, I've seen more thoughtfulness about accessibility than I've seen anywhere else in my life. And it's just incredible. Um, I just, it's really amazed me. I mean, I've, I had a lot of bad experiences before I came here. And so it's probably why I feel this way. It's, you know, I went to community college before I came here and there was a class that I got into where I was told, okay, all of your materials are on this website. And I knew because I had checked before even enrolling in the class, is this accessible? I was told no. Told my professor that and proceeded to get no more responses from the professor. Um, when I get here, if I ever have any problems, everybody's like, oh yeah, let me fix that for you. And this is not something I experienced before. I had another class where I was in an English class and so professors typically leave comments on your paper and for some reason Blackboard wouldn't read the comments to me. I didn't even know she was leaving them until super late in the semester, she, uh, we had the, we had the, uh, how some teachers do conferences and they basically tell you if they think, how they think you're doing and what you need to do to pass the class. And she said, you haven't followed any of the comments I've left you. I said, I had no idea you were even leaving them. She says, not my problem. You haven't been following them. And so you're either gonna drop this class or you're gonna fail it. And I had to drop it with two weeks left at the end of the semester. Um, I get here and I'm taking the same class again. and have been completely met with a different perspective. I have a professor that's just gone above and beyond. You know, if you can't access this, I get it. Like, talk to me about it, let me know. We'll work around it, things like that. Um, I've just had nothing but wonderful experiences here. 
There are some things still though that are difficult. Uh, navigating the quad is, the quad is evil. Um, I still sometimes turn the wrong way out there. And that's like the only place on campus that I have any problems anymore. Um, all my life I was told, uh, don't go to events, uh, you know, or maybe not even go to events, but don't hang out with people because they don't know what to do with you. And so you're not gonna be received well. And so I've been hearing that my entire life. Um, I would go to events at my youth group, for example, and it would come true. They don't know what to do with you. I would end up just hanging out with the leaders the whole time because the other kids were like, I'm not doing that. And so I will do things like debate up until the last second if I should go to an event because I don't know how I'll be received and if, if people will actually want me to come. Um, so a lot of times, I'll look at something that's being put out there and I'll be like, well, I don't know how to get there and I'm not bothering anybody, so I'm just not gonna go. Um, but there have been other times where I said, oh, well, I'm gonna reach out to somebody and see, and it always has turned out well. People here, the students here are just incredible by how they're like, yeah, let me help you. And, you know, I'll take you with me and spend the day with you or, you know, the, the time or get you to somewhere where you can have if I'm with everybody else and just really inclusive and not something that I've seen very much. Um, I also had an incident in class. I think it was more just a rookie mistake, but where the teacher went around the room and asked everybody to answer a question. And I was in the front row and he started in the second row and went back. And I was like, I cut in and about three rows back, I'm like, did you mean to do that? And he was like, oh, shoot, you know, you didn't write on the paper. I didn't know. And like, so things like that were very scary. The, the first week was a little scary. Um, I could definitely relate to Ryan and her saying about, you know, having fear when she started out here because I did too. I was very nervous, but everyone has totally exceeded my expectations. I came in with very low expectations of how things were going to go. And Access has not only like blown me away, but encouraged me to start expecting more and to start like, this shouldn't be your average life experience, even though it is, you don't have to look at it that way. And so I've learned to, okay, so I can advocate for these things because I do deserve it. And it's not like, wow, they actually accommodated me. It's, hey, how can we do this at the very beginning? you should expect accommodations not be so quite so blown away. Like it's a very positive thing and I should be happy about it, but it shouldn't be like a shock. So I'm just really hoping that the rest of my time here is the same way where people are super accommodating and willing to help. And I definitely feel like it's going to be because it's just the amazing vibe I've gotten since I've been here. And uh, I hope it all continues. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie and Elena, for sharing about your experiences and about the state of accessibility at SIUE. I appreciate just your honesty and your vulnerability and your willingness to share your stories with us. Um, and I don't know at this how time, well... I'd actually like to invite everyone, if you're willing, to turn on your microphones and actually take a moment to applaud our student speakers. Yay! Yay! Awesome! Awesome! Yay! Wonderful! Great work, everyone! Great work! Um, okay, we're going to take a few minutes and provide you all uh, with the opportunity to share and actually re react to what you heard Ryan, Elena, and Katie share, and we're going to send you into some breakout rooms. Uh, we'd simply just like to create a space for you to share your thoughts about the state of accessibility at SIUE and to respond to some of the following questions. So what do you think about what the student shared tonight? Did anything surprise you? Is accessibility something you've thought much about um, or are you new to this conversation? What do you think about the current state of accessibility at SIUE? And what are some ways that SIUE can improve accessibility? Uh, we just ask that if you do decide to share that you just introduce yourself and state how you're connected to SIUE so that others in your breakout room can know who you are. 
Um, so we're gonna send you to those rooms and we'll see you back here in about seven minutes. Um, hi everyone, I'm Asia Locke, practicum student. If you would like the captioner to follow you to your breakout room, please just send me a private message so that I could assign you accordingly. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had an opportunity to meet some new people around SIUE and kind of just start the conversation about uh, what might make SIUE more accessible and what that would look like. Um, at this time, I'd actually like to invite Dominic Dorsey, the Director of Access, to present this year's awards for the Champions of Accessibility. Thank you, Mari, and thank you for to all of the speakers up until this point. Um, Ryan and Elena and Katie have set an extremely high bar that I don't want to follow, uh, but I will do my absolute best to not bore uh, the remaining individuals who are here with us joining us online uh, for this event. Um, this is probably next to hearing the stories of the students. This is my favorite part of the event because we get to recognize individuals across campus who themselves are champions of accessibility in the spirit of Ed Roberts. Um, we often talk about how equity is an afterthought and accessibility is literally uh, an equitable experience for each individual based upon their particular diagnosis, how it impacts them, what classes they're taking and how they navigate the world. Um, so being a champion of accessibility means a lot. It means that you are uh, in tuned and are individually uh, taking into account the needs of the individuals that you meet on a regular basis, whether it be in your classes, whether it be in your interactions uh, and working with students and paraprofessionals and so on and so forth. So without any further ado or pontification, uh, we will get right into our awards. First up is the Defender of Equity Award. Uh, this is an award that we give to our faculty. Uh, and we first and foremost want to say thank you to, again, uh, all of our faculty across campus who truly see the need to provide an accessible experience for each student um, and go the extra mile. Uh, and it shouldn't be the extra mile, but actually take stock in their class um, and try to do what they can to make it a universally designed experience but also are responsive to the students and making sure that they are receiving exactly what they need in terms of accessibility. Uh, we had a ton of nominees this year, which is great. Uh, the Defender of Equity Award nominees are as follows. Dr. Michael Hare from Management and Marketing. Dr. Candace Hall from the College Student Personnel Administration Program. Dr. Ariel Jones from the School of Social Work. Dr. Danielle Lee, from the School of Biological Sciences, Dr. Timothy Lewis from Political Science, Dr. Brittany Peterson, also from Political Science, Dr. Ann Popkis from the School of Nursing, Dr. Lori Rice from the School of Political Science, Dr. Isaiah Smith from Sociology, and Dr. Kevin Tucker from the School of Chemistry. And I'm just going to take a moment to read from our nominee or the person who nominated them, uh, just and they stated, this individual has been stellar about making sure students are supported and their accessibility needs are met. I noticed them making adjustments as needed to achieve universal design in their classes and responding diligent to student needs. I can also say personally that this particular individual uh, shares a passion for accessibility the same way that I do, and that if they are not accessible, they will actually text me and let me know so that they can be on my radar as well so we can continue to do the work of access to make sure all individuals realize that it's not just the responsibility of access to make sure things are accessible, but each and every individual from the chancellor on down. So with no further ado, it is my pleasure to award this year's Defender of Equity Award to Dr. Candace Hall. So with that, Dr. Hall, I, I offer you the floor to say a few words, if you please. Oh, it's funny because I have a student in my office. And I just looked at him like, I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't ever really think about it as, as doing work, just, um, we're all here for the students, right? And to be able to do the very best that I can to make sure that students have um, an equitable experience in, in my classes and my program is, that's that's my job, that's my responsibility. And in our breakout session, Dr. Lewis and I, and um, a few of the other faculty members, I'm gonna forget their names, we were just talking about like, you know, that this needs to be an institutional commitment when faculty members are giving students difficult times, um, there needs to be some reprimand that happens, right? Um, because if we are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we should be making sure that our students are having positive experiences in our classroom and across our campus. So um, I'm excited to be awarded um, this, presented this award, um, and I'm just energized to continue to do the work. And I also want to say congratulations to all the other faculty that were nominated alongside me. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it's not just an, an on-screen congratulatory thing. For all of the awardees, you will actually get some, some nice crystal hardware. Uh, it just has not arrived yet. So uh, be on the lookout for that. But thank you again, Dr. Hall. And thank you again to all of the faculty nominees. Next up is our Defender of Equity Award for staff. Um, again, the faculty do a phenomenal job of making sure that we have an equitable experience for our students, but uh, the unsung heroes uh, often not talked about, but doing a lot of uh, the healing work for our students across various divisions and departments are our staff. So we want to thank all of our staff nominees. With this caveat, um, both of my assistant directors, Jim Boyle and Andy Koch, were nominated. And while we are appreciative and want to recognize uh, that the students uh, appreciate their work, uh, they are not eligible for this award. So uh, Andy and, and Jim, unfortunately, you will not be able to clear off any space on your trophy shelf. This one is not for you. Um, but <laughs> we do want to recognize uh, all of our nominees this year for the Staff Defender of Equity Award. Uh, among those individuals are Kimberly Kilgore from the Office of Educational Outreach, Lindsay Steitzel from uh, Kimmel Student Involvement, Lindy Wagner from the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, actually known as the Hub now, as well as Simone Williams from the Love Joy Library. And I will read just a few words from the nominee or the nominator about this year's winner. Um, I want to mention that they have the heart and passion for serving students and they make sure that they have every chance of succeeding. They're always willing and eager to partner with Access and has served as a mentor to several of our students in the BUILD mentoring program. They are thoughtful, genuinely care and develop programs to promote leadership for students campus-wide. Uh, I am thrilled and elated uh, because I too share these sentiments about this particular individual. They are someone that I consider a friend and colleague on campus. So please join me in congratulating this year's Defender of Equity Award nominee winner staff, Melinda Steitzel. Melinda, you are here with us. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, I can try. Um, <laughs> I'm genuinely like moved to tears. So um, just thank you uh, for all of access, for all of you do, for all that you do, for putting on this event, for providing a platform for three phenomenal student speakers earlier to share their story and their experiences. Um, grateful to work on a campus where accessibility is something that is valued. Um, and yeah, just still learning, always learning. And uh, thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate you. And congratulations again. And congratulations to all of our staff nominees this year. All right. Last but certainly not least, in a little bit of a different title, uh, the Messenger of Inclusion Award, again, in the spirit of Ed Roberts, because as he is known as a champion of accessibility once he graduated, he did start out his mission in terms of accessibility and advocacy as a student. So in like fashion, we want to recognize our messengers of inclusion on campus who are doing similar work. 
This year's nominees include Julia Gorin, Caitlin Hall, Hannah Puckett, and Jada Weaver. And I just want to say a few words from the nominator about this year's award recipient. This individual always advocates for themselves when they have an accessibility issue, and they do so with a good attitude. Um, they're always telling me about how much they love and appreciate access. They're so proud in their efforts to make SIUE more accessible for themselves and make campus more accessible for other visually impaired students who may choose to attend SIUE in the future. Um, I consider all of the students who use access to be my kids, my babies, um, and I am especially protective of, of this particular student. Um, I, I see her as one of my kids from the moment that she came into the, to the office. Um, we are so grateful and proud of all of the work that she has done up to this point, um, especially because, and I joke with her about this, she's got a sunny disposition about everything, um, even in circumstances that make my blood boil. She smiles and helps me to calm down even as I'm advocating for her. So. Without any more ado on my part, please join me in congratulating this year's Messenger of Inclusion Award winner, Caitlin Hall. Caitlin, you're picking up some hardware. You wanna say a few words about being this year's award winner? Thank you. <laughs> I, I, uh, sorry, speechless. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I just, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I will say this, I will share this because I, I, can, I can look at you and tell that you're genuinely flummoxed and don't know what to say. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I take every instance that, that Katie has brought to me and I bring it to other people and say, this should not happen. And, and she says, oh, well, that, that's a Tuesday. But we've had situations where we took her to ITS to get her computer fixed and a staff member literally slid a, phone number on a piece of paper across the table to her, um, expecting her to pick that up and do something with it. Um, she's had experiences where, you know, she talked about the quad being a nightmare, um, where she tried to strike up a conversation with a group of people or ask, hey, can you tell me where I am to help me get to the next place and literally hear that group of people walk away from her. Um, she's had so many experiences that would break uh, many people and deter them from wanting to come back to school for another day. But not only does she face these challenges with a smile and determination to come back and make it better, uh, but her experience and her speaking up for herself and changing things across campus has been so tremendous that we now have, uh, what is it, three or four students, uh, visually impaired students who are coming to SIUE in anticipation of joining us. Which one is it, three or four? Three, as it's of right three now. Students? Well, three for next year, one for the following. So yes. <laughs> so she is literally blazing a trail for her fellow students to come behind her um, and holding our feet to the fire and holding us accountable in the process. So uh, I wanna give you your flowers while you can smell them. So congratulations to you again, uh, Caitlin Hall. I do just wanna say one thing, I, cause I've noticed just listening to all of you guys talk, I just, I really appreciate how SIUE, like accessibility is such a big thing and like, it's not an afterthought here. And that's something I haven't seen much elsewhere so thank you thank you all right so as i try to push the butterflies back down out of my stomach i will turn it back over to you mari all right yes congratulations again to katie melinda and dr hall on their awards uh, we're so thankful for the work that you've been doing at SIUE to advocate for accessibility and to make education events and resources more accessible for everybody um, so one of the ways that Access is trying to help make uh, accommodations uh, like more accessible and SIUE more accessible is coordinating uh, note-taking. So note-taking is an accommodation that is often offered to students who have difficulty focusing in classes for a variety of reasons, such as ADHD, anxiety, depression, or in tandem with intermittent absence accommodation. Uh, so last year, Access received 587 requests for note takers and had 226 student volunteers take notes. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of notes. Uh, this semester, Access has started to offer a note taking software accommodation called Glean. 
Uh, this accommodation allows students to record lectures and creates a visual of the audio sound waves that students can track comments onto. And they can simply uh, like hit a button or mark a point on the lecture that they need to make sure to go back and listen to or drop notes onto it. Um, so we're going to hear from Amanda, who's a master's in social work student, about her experience using Glean this semester. Hi, my name is Amanda, and I'm in my second year of my grad program at SIUE, and I'm also an access student. They helped me with my um, dyslexia and learning disability. Before Galeen, the way how I took my notes was with the accommodation of volunteer note takers. Um, but that didn't always work out for me sometimes because I would be in classes that there wouldn't be volunteer note takers. And then that's when I would like work with the professor and they would normally just give me PowerPoints instead of having to write them myself. But that has changed now that I have Glean. I began using Glean in the beginning of the fall 2021 semester. And so far I've been really enjoying it. My experience so far with Glean, like I said earlier, I've really been enjoying it. Um, something that Glean has helped me with is reduce my stress and anxiety when it comes to taking notes. Because in the past, I would be in some classes that I wouldn't get a volunteer note taker and or if I did get a volunteer note taker, um, I would worry about if they were sick on a day or if they missed notes or whatnot. So being able to uh, cut out the middleman and not have to worry or rely on someone else has reduced a lot of my stress. And also the fact of just being able to have the program on my own personal device, it makes it very convenient and I really enjoy how I'm able to put in PowerPoints or able to put in links or it's just it it allows me to compile all of my notes in one spot and then additionally I'm able to record my professor's lectures so I can go back and listen to things and add additional notes and it's just it helps me so much and it truly is a game changer. Um, and I am very grateful that I have this tool now to use. My overall thoughts about Glean is that it's a really great tool for people to use, especially for individuals who worry or struggle about note taking. Um, it has helped relieve almost all of my stress, specifically over note taking now. And um, I also am excited to learn more about it. Um, I've only been using it for a semester now and there's still so many more like tools that I still haven't really utilized within Glean. So I'm excited to continue to learn um, more about it and um, see other ways how it can help me in my future with being a student. Awesome. Well, we, we definitely thank uh, Amanda for her testimonial uh, about Glean. Um, in addition to being a, a social work student, she's also a practicum student in our office, and we're thankful for, for her participation, not only in this event, but in the support of all of the events and the things that we do in our office. Um, just to kind of capitalize on what she was saying, and, and Andy had mentioned it in the comments, uh, I think that what's truly game changing, what's most game changing about the Glean software is the independence that it offers our students. Um, I've been doing this work for a long time, and one of the more boilerplate accommodations is that of note taking for students. Uh, the ability to be able to take good notes in class uh, is fundamental. Uh, and for many of us who have graduated from college, we know how instrumental it was in us passing those key courses. Uh, and as it's been talked about tonight, we do have and struggle with providing that accommodation in classes where students are not willing to be or not able to be or no one comes forward to be a volunteer note taker. 
And then because we work in or are taking classes in higher ed, we know that all notes aren't created equal. So sometimes the notes that are donated essentially aren't necessarily the notes that are going to help a student to be uh, or present their best self in regards to uh, accommodating their particular diagnoses. So GLEAN is one of those programs uh, that truly helps a student to mitigate their own circumstances. It teaches them not only how to take better notes, but gives them all of the tools to be successful in that class and synthesize all of that material and glean from the lecture, quite literally, uh, everything that they need to know in order to make it uh, fit and make sense for them. So here's where things get interesting. We know that money is tight all across the institution, and it's especially tight in our, in our particular office. Uh, the ADA is an unfunded mandate, which means that we don't get an enormous amount of money to be able to pay for the things that we need to do or that we need to have in order to help our students be successful, to level the playing field, as Ryan spoke about earlier. Um, at the present time, we have leaned through this year, but next year we don't have the funds to be able to provide it to students yet again. So what our goal is, is to raise approximately $3,000 so that we can continue to provide this service for students. And in the grand scheme of things, $3,000 may not seem like a lot, but for us, it would be a tremendous boost. Um, and we have a lot of people on this call, some students, some faculty. Uh, for students, if you could give $10, that's your Netflix subscription for the month. Faculty, if you could give $50. Staff, if you could get $50. Administrators, if you could give $50 to $100 uh, to support such a campaign, again, it would be game changing for our office. And even beyond things like Glean, there are so many other services and uh, resources that we provide to students, such as the reader pens that students use who may have print-based disabilities and need to have information read aloud to them. Uh, we would love to be able to raise enough money to provide more evac chairs across campus. Uh, there's several different products and services that have licenses that expire. So when we talk about screen reading software for students who have visual impairments, uh, when we talk about being able to pay for things like uh, uh, real-time captioners, all of the services that we provide are at a cost. And unfortunately, that well runs empty more often than not. So we're asking for your help to be fellow champions of accessibility, to be not just allies and, and you know, advocates, but accomplices to, to put some skin in the game with us and donate your not just your time, but your, your hard-earned dollars to help support the students who utilize services at Access. Uh, you can go to our website, siue.edu backslash give dash now backslash access um, and make a donation make a monthly donation, uh, and not just today, but share it with all of your friends and colleagues in your departments and across campus, and let them know that uh, there's something really, truly tangible that they can do to support our students beyond just raising awareness, but actually putting services and resources in their hands to help them be successful. Again, we appreciate any donation. Uh, we're happy to get the kind that jingles, but we'd much rather get the amount that folds. Uh, so again, we thank you in advance for your giving and, and look forward to being able to provide Glean for not just next semester, but for years to come for our Access students. So with that being said, uh, definitely want to thank everybody for their attendance. I first and foremost want to thank uh, Mari for all of her time, energy, and effort on putting this whole event together. Uh, we, we've done this, like I said, three years now, and for us to do this virtually and have all of these moving parts and components and things of that nature, um, truly blown away. And don't know how we got along so long without Mari's presence, so thank you. Uh, thank you to our practicum students. Thank you to Asia and Lindsay. Uh, thank you to our speakers for tonight. Thank you to uh, Ryan, amazing job uh, in, in your rendition from Freaky Friday. Thank you, Elena. Again, Elena is at the front desk and triaging so many of the student concerns that come in. Uh, that's a lot of labor on one student to, to hear some of the stories and uh, have to deal with some of the horrors, even in directing traffic between all of our individual offices. So we are truly appreciative of you. Uh, thank you again to Caitlin. Thank you to my amazing staff. Uh, thank you to Michelle, to Andy, to Jim to Calandra, to Bertine, and everything that she's doing with BUILD. Uh, thank you to our all of our amazing faculty, staff, 
uh, and, and students who are doing the work of championing accessibility across campus. Um, if you are looking for ways to get involved, if you have not been involved yet as a student, I encourage you to get involved with uh, our student organization, New Horizons. Uh, if you are interested in being a build mentor, we truly need mentors. Um, if there's ever a uh, ask of you is to be a mentor because we have so many more mentees needing a mentor than we have mentors to be able to fulfill that commitment. So if you have an interest in being a mentor for a, a diverse learner, a student with a disability on our campus, we encourage you to sign up for Build Mentoring and reach out to uh, Bertine Blanc for more information on that. If you see something on campus, if there is a door that is not accessible, if there is a pathway that is not clear, uh, if there is something that looks inaccessible, whether it be physical or digital, we encourage you to fill out the Disability Access Response Tool or DART and get that information right over to us. And James Boyle, who is uh, one of my assistant directors, he will get right on top of that and connect all of the necessary parties to make sure that we not only are getting it resolved in a timely manner, but we're following the issue from start to finish and letting uh, the respondent parties know exactly how close we are to resolving it. And if you just wanna contact our office, we encourage you to stop by, give us a call, send us an email. We are located in the Student Success Center. Um, if you wanna give us a call, our number is 618-650-3726. You can always email us at myaccess at siue.edu. And of course, we're open in the office Monday through Friday from 8 until 4.30, but in service to our evening tests and our students who are taking evening classes, we are open uh, providing accommodations to those students well into the evenings. So we're doing everything that we can to meet the students where they are and provide a much more accessible campus, uh, literally welcoming campus to these students. Um, and we appreciate all of the work and the labor that you do to assist us in that effort. Accessible campus community means that it is the entire campus's responsibility to make an accessible environment for these students. So we thank you for your attendance. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing and look forward to your participation and attendance next year. So with that, I wish you blessings and good night.